Approximate length of an unsharpened number two pencil. Here is a number two pencil. It's sharpened a bit. Uh, so yours would, would be, if it was unsharpened, to be a bit longer. Um, and uh, our choices, now these approximation problems are usually just a question of do you understand um, what scientific notation is and just the approximate reasonable sizes of things. Um, all of these are two. 2.0, 2.0 times 10 to the minus 2 meters times 10 to the minus 1 meter times 10 to the 0 meter and times 10 to the 1 meter. So we're uh, here I have a ruler. You're going to have a ruler like that. Uh, so we're looking at 2 zero on the ruler. Uh, maybe 20 so this thing is is 20 somethings. I look at it and I see it's 20 centimeters. Now on the rulers, a lot of times they'll say mm. The millimeters are the little ones. Um, hopefully you've figured that out by now. Uh, the the numbers are actually centimeters. The little tick marks are millimeters. Um, so that's 20 centimeters when you read there. So we just uh, let's take a look. It, what centi is? Uh, centi is 10 to the minus 2 meters. All right, 10 to the minus 2 meters. And uh, if we wanted to uh, make this 2.0, 2.0, I moved the decimal point one place here. I made this smaller. I have to make this bigger. Um, so this is going to be negative 1, because 10 to the negative 1 is uh, 10 times bigger than 10 times uh, 10 to the negative 2. So I made this one smaller by a factor of 10, and I made this larger by a factor of 10, and so this would be the answer. All right, let's remind ourselves why uh, 10 to the 0 is 1. Well, we know that uh, 10 to the 2 is 100, so it just stands to reason 10 to the 1 is 10, and uh, therefore uh, this must be 1. If we look at the trend, this is 0.1 and this is 0.01. So we see the trend, and in that case, it makes sense that 10 to the 0 is indeed 1. Number 37, conservation of momentum. Let's, uh, <coughs> let's draw a picture. Uh, the things, of course, that are conserved, the things that are conserved in nature are energy, momentum, charge, and uh, yeah, that's about it. Um, uh, those are the big ones that we're covering. All right, always draw a picture. So beforehand, we had a velocity and a velocity and two carts of different masses. And afterwards, afterwards they collide. And what does it say? After the collision, the four kilogram cart moved to the right. All right. So after the collision, the four kilogram cart is moving to the right, like that. Uh, let me draw the ground. Four kilograms, eight kilograms. Uh, eight kilograms. I'm not gonna put the significant figures in there just because there isn't room. All right, conservation of momentum. Write down the equation. First thing to get full credit, P before equals P after. In a closed isolated system, um, <clears throat> momentum is conserved. Uh, so anyways, 
we had four meters per second, six meters per second, and here we had three meters per second. All right, uh, so we have, uh, we're going to have uh, momentum before is the momentum of this thing plus the momentum of that thing. Keep in mind, we're going to say the right is positive and the left is negative. Uh, eight kilograms times four meters per second, and that's positive because it's that way, plus four kilograms uh, negative six meters per second, and that's where you might run into some problems ignoring direction. Uh, that equals what happens afterwards, which is eight kilograms times the velocity of the, I'll put velocity eight of the eight kilogram plus four kilograms, the momentum of that times three meters per second. And uh, that is uh, positive. And solving for V8, we get the velocity of eight is going to be eight kilogram meters per second minus 12 kilogram meters per second, all divided by eight, which is negative 0.5 meters per second. So we ended up with negative 8.5 uh, meters per second. Uh, so that's that way and uh, 0.5 meters per second. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, looks like they bounced off each other. Uh, sure, why not? All right. And the negative, actually, we shouldn't, uh, we should actually just say 0.5 meters per second that way. Uh, what's the choice? 0.5 meters per second to the left. That would be choice one. This is problem number 38. Uh, as a result of these forces, what's the block going to do? Well, let's add them up. Um, if it's in equilibrium, it's going to be at rest or constant velocity. If there's an unbalanced force, it will accelerate in the direction of the unbalanced force. Uh, so let's, let's add this two ways. Let's take a look at it like this. Um, I have 100 going this way. And I have a 120 newtons going that way. And I have 80 newtons upward and 80 newtons downward. All right, so just a, kind of a shortcut to adding these. We could clearly see that uh, these two um, don't supply any unbalanced force. And... Um, when we add these up, we're going to lose the 100, and we're going to lose that. So we're actually going to end up with just 20 newtons uh, going this way. We can see that we're just going to have an unbalanced force of 20 newtons that way. We just see that that's 20 bigger that way, and uh, that's what it adds up to be. And that's a, a nice, quick, and convenient way. Uh, we could always add these up in the normal uh, vector addition mode. Um, we could say, okay, well, I have... 80 newtons here, so we're just going to add these up tip to tail. I do 80 newtons, then we go over 100 newtons, and then we go up 80 newtons, and then we go over 120 newtons. Let me put this 80 here. All right, so our resultant is from where we started to where we ended, and we started here and we ended there. This is indeed 20 newtons of that way. Um, so it gives us the same answer regardless of how we do it. All right. So uh, we have 20 newtons airway. That is our net force. Let's recall acceleration is caused by a net force. Um, and the acceleration will be in the direction of the net force. And this will accelerate to the left. Number four, moves at constant speed to the right. No, it's definitely not constant speed. Uh, it could be moving to the right. Moves at constant speed to the left. No, it's not constant speed, it's accelerating. It could be moving to the left. Uh, accelerates to the right, no, it accelerates to the left. All right? So this could be 
moving this way, we could have a velocity this way, in which case, if it was doing that, it would be slowing down. Right? It could be moving this way and slowing down. Or it could be going this way and speeding up. All right. Number 39. If a motor lifts a 400 kilogram mass at vertical distance of 10 meters in 8 seconds, the minimum power generated, generated by the motor. All right, so we have to calculate how much power it's going to take uh, to lift something. So uh, power is the rate at which energy is used or supplied or something like that. It's uh, energy divided by time. And I think the easiest way to look at this one would be um, what happens. So what's the work that needs to be done to this uh, 400 Newton block? It's going to lift it. Uh, no, 400 kilograms, sorry, 400 kilogram block. It's going to be lifted uh, 10 meters, right? It's going to start uh, here, and it's going to be lifted 10 meters. All right. Um, what happens to the work done? Uh, the important idea with work is that work changes the energy of the system, so the work you do in lifting that uh, will become gravitational potential energy, um, and uh, we can calculate what that is. So really, this is going to be the uh, gravitational potential energy divided by how long it takes. Uh, but that's just going to be mgh uh, divided by t, and uh, it's actually the change in gravitational potential energy. Um, what do we have? 400 kilograms times... 9.81 meters per second squared times the height, which is 10 meters, divided by the time, which is 8 seconds. And it's uh, 4,905. Uh, this would be joules per second or watts. Watts. Watts are probably a better unit. Uh, which one is that? Um, and um, it's going to be two significant figures. So it looks like a 4.9 times 10 to the 3 watts. Choice 3. Number 40. A 4 kilogram object is ex accelerated at 3 meters per second squared north by an unbalanced force. The same unbalanced force acting on a 2 kilogram object will accelerate this object north at what? All right. So let's see. So here's our four kilogram object. And it's accelerated three meters per second squared north. Let's say this way is north. Uh, so north is this way. That way is north. Um, and uh, has an acceleration of three meters per second squared by some force. All right. And so the acceleration is uh, going to be uh, three meters per second squared uh, that way also. Accelerations in the direction of the net force. Uh, <clears throat> the same unbalanced force, all right, it's unbalanced, there we go, um, is acting on a two kilogram object. Two kilogram. Maybe I'll make it smaller. Made out of the same stuff, so it would have half the volume. Uh, two kilograms. Same unbalanced force, F. What is the acceleration? All right. Well, acceleration, of course, is uh, F net, uh, but this is, I'll call this F net, because I said it was the unbalanced force, uh, divided by uh, M. M, 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 M. Well, we could calculate the, uh, the net force. That would probably be the, 
the uh, most straightforward way that many of you uh, would be comfortable with. Um, or I could say M A acceleration one and acceleration two. Let's do that. Let's do that. Uh, acceleration equals that. Acceleration two equals the same net force divided by M two. All right. Um, and we know M1 and M2. So let's uh, combine these equations. Uh, we could just say, okay, M1 A1 equals F net. M2 A2 equals F net. Um, so they both equal F net. So M1 A1 equals M2 A2. And uh, therefore, A2 equals M1 A1 over M2. Am I still on the board or still on the screen? I'm not sure. Um, M1 is four kilograms times three meters per second squared, all divided by M2, which is two kilograms. Uh, that's going to be six. Six meters per second squared. Does that make sense? Um, I have uh, half the mass, so for the same force I would expect double the acceleration um, because we could see that the acceleration is indeed uh, inversely proportional to the mass. So anyway, six meters per second squared, uh, which is two. Choice two. 41. An electron is located in an electric field of magnitude 600 newtons per coulomb. What is the magnitude of the electrostatic force acting on the electron? Oh, all right. So here's an electron, and I'll put it in a uniform a electric field. Let's say it's like that. All right, so it's in an electric field. Um, which way is the force going to be? Well, the force, um, the electric field is defined is in the direction that a positive test charge would feel a force. So if I put a positive test charge there, it would experience a force this way, all right? So therefore, our electron experiences a force of this way, like that, all right? Anyway, so there's our electron in an electric field. And the electric field has a magnitude of 600 newtons per coulomb, okay? You give me a coulomb of charge, you plop it in there, it's going to feel a force of 600 newtons. And if it's positive, it'll feel a force that way. If it's negative, it'll feel a force that way. What is the magnitude of the electrostatic force acting on the electron? Oh, well, of course, we have the hidden information. They said it's the electron, so we have the charge um, so the charge is going to be minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs or minus 1e. Which one of these should we use? Should we use coulombs or elementary charges? Which one's the standard unit? That's right. The coulomb is the standard unit. Very good. Give yourself a gold star for getting that right. Elementary charges are convenient units for certain things, but they are not standard. So anyways... Um, the uh, electric field is the uh, electrostatic force divided by the charge on an object. That's a definition. Um, and actually, the gravitational field is a gravitational uh, force uh, divided by the mass. You can see the relationship. Uh, they're very similar between electricity and gravity. Anyways, let's take this one. And uh, let's see, what are we solving for? The electrostatic force is the electric field times the charge is 600 newtons per coulomb times minus 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19. All right, I once wrote a poem with the word coulomb in it, and it ended with, um, get off my futon, doulom. Right. It's not easy to rhyme with Coulomb, but I pulled it off and pulled it off quite spectacularly. My students enjoyed it immensely. Mm -hmm.
Yeah, why wouldn't they? 9.6 times 10 to the minus 70, 17 newtons. Newtons. Three. That's plug and chug city right there. That's making some of you feel really comfortable. The current in a wire is 4 amperes. I'll just write that down. The time required is, okay, so that's what I'm asking for, to, for uh, 2.5 times 10 to the 19 electrons. All right, uh, so that's the charge. Is 2.5 times 10 to the 19 elementary charges, because each electron has an elementary charge, each proton has an elementary charge, each positron has an elementary charge. Oh, what's, oh, well, that's just too easy. That's just the definition of current. The definition of current is the amount of charge that passes a single point in time in a single spot in a point of time, uh, which is 10.5 times 10 to the 19. Oh, that's no good. I got a problem. I'm using elementary charges. I need to convert that to coulombs. Get off my futon, doulomb. Um. So let's convert that. Let's multiply by ones. I know that one elementary charge is 1.6 times 10 to the minus 19 coulombs. Get off my futon, doulomb. Four coulombs. Coulombs. Get off my futon, doulomb. So anyways, uh, the amount of time is going to be uh, delta Q over I. I. Shouldn't that be me? Did, did, has anyone ever taken an English test recently? I don't think it should be over I. I think it should be over me. 4.0 coulombs divided by 4. Oh. Well, I can do this in my head. 1 ampere. Um, 1 ampere. 1 ampere. 1 second. <laughs> Coulomb per amp, which is a second. One second. Choice one. 42 is one. So we have two charges. Um, we have uh, Q1 and uh, Q2. And there's a force between them. Let's see what it is. The electrostatic force is K. Q1, Q2 divided by the distance between them squared. The distance between them squared. R. All right. That's uh, the first case. In the second case, uh, we, it, we have, uh, what do we have? Uh, we have a 2 times Q1, 2Q1, and we have 4Q2, so, so you have some bigger charges, and how much are they separated by? 2R. Now, this is where you have to be careful. This is where you could really mess things up a little bit. If you just say 2R squared, and then I would go, no, no, no. You need to square the whole denominator. Uh, so that's going to be, you're going to get up with something like this. 2, Q1, 4Q2 over 4R squared. We can get rid of those. This looks like it's just going to be 2 times bigger. 2K, Q1, Q2 over R squared. Something like that. That looks like it's 2 times bigger than that. So uh, this is going to be, if this is F, then this is 2F. Right? That's F. Right there. It's F. So it's 2F. Right? This is F. Right here. F. Choice 2. Yeah. The composition of a meson with a uh, charge of minus 1 element charge could be a meson, of course, is a quark and an anti-quark. Quark, and then we put a line over the top that's anti. Is it a meson? Is this right in your reference table? Check it out. You don't believe me? I wouldn't believe me. And it has to have a charge of minus 20. All right. Well, right off the bat, I can get rid of 2 and 4, because 2 is 3 quarks, and 4 is 3 anti-quarks. So eh, neither of those are happening. Those aren't mesons. Those are uh, 
Yeah, those are baryons. Okay, so let's see a, a strange, let's see a strange and an anti-charm. So a strange is a charge of minus one-third elementary charges, and an anti-charm has a minus two-thirds elementary charges. Since a charm is plus two-thirds, an anti-charm, so that equals negative one. I'm thinking it's choice one. I'm thinking that. Let's see what's wrong with choice two. Um, choice three, I mean. And up, up has a charge of plus two-thirds. Well, already we're heading in the wrong direction. We're positive. Um, I'm positive we're heading in the wrong direction. Uh, Anti-bottom. Uh, Anti-bottom. Plus one third. All right, so we're looking way too positive. Yeah. Way too positive. So that's the answer right there. Which graph represents the relationship between the kinetic energy and the speed of a freely falling object? Find a mathematical relationship between the axes. See if you can find a relationship between speed and kinetic energy. I think you can. I think it's right here. Kinetic energy is one half m v squared. Uh, it's the same object, so it's going to be the same mass. Uh, let's see. All right, let's perform extreme physics. Extreme. All right, let's see your v in kinetic energy right there. When v is extremely small, it was zero. Kinetic energy is zero. When V is big, and kinetic energy is really big. So we got zero, zero, big, big. Is that linear? No, of course that's not linear. Our X variable is squared. That is an exponential function, and it kind of does something like that. Uh, I guess that's three. Know your extreme physics. This diagram represents an electric field between two oppositely charged Conducting spheres, all right. All right, we got this charged object, we have this charged object. Conveniently, they've oriented them the same way in all of these. Let me get a positive test charge. Here's my positive test charge. I'm going to do a thought experiment. It's right here. Uh, if I put my positive test charge in uh, around this, uh, somehow space has changed. We say there's a field here. Um, I'm going to, uh, see which way it experiences a force because the electric field is defined as the direction of the force. So if we put it here, a uh, positive test charge, of course, is going to be repelled. Two positive charges are going to repel and attract it here. So actually, anywhere along here, it's going to experience a force like that. Right? Uh, right off the bat, I can see it's going to be number three. Uh, anyway, so, <clears throat> but let's think about further. If I put it here, it's initially not going to notice that one. It's going to feel forced that way. But then, as it gets farther away and a little closer to this one, it's going to notice that one. It's going to curve around like that. And, and then we go something like that. And uh, so forth. And uh, I don't know. I hate they, that they draw these without them looping around. Really, what's, you know, what, what happens is they do stuff like this. Like, like this. Like that. Like that. All right? So know how to draw your... Uh, Electric fields, they're on point charges. Parallel plates, zoink, uh, they're very important. Also called capacitors, also called Mr. Hoppers. Mr. Hoppers, the bunny. The bunny with an attitude. Mr. Hoppers. Mm, uh, let's, let's go evenly charged here. Uh, the nice thing about uh, parallel plates is the electric field is constant in between them. Let's see which way is the field. It's going to be repelled from the plus, attracted to the minus. So the field between these parallel plates will look like this. Notice I draw touching each plate, and I draw them evenly spaced. Evenly spaced. Even, oh, let's make it a little bigger. Evenly spaced. All right, there will be a small fringing about, around, about the edges, but that's not the important thing. The important thing is that the electric field is the same everywhere between them, and the force 
on a charged object is the electric field times the charge. And that tells us that no matter where I put my charge, it's going to feel a constant force because the charge doesn't change, the charged object doesn't change, and it's in a constant electric field. So no matter where I put it here, I put it here, 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 it's going to experience the same force anywhere in this constant field. 47. Which graph represents the relationship between the magnitude of the gravitational field between two masses and the distance r between the centers of masses? <laughs> I think, I think, yeah. I, <coughs> I think I'm so happy that I learned extreme physics at the beginning of the year, because now this is just the gift that keeps on giving. Thank you, me. Thank you for teaching me this. I, I'm so happy that I did that for myself. Uh, force of gravity, let's get a relationship uh, between two masses. All right. So we have two masses. Here we go. Mass M1, <coughs> M2, uh, between their centers. And that's a key idea. <laughs> between their centers, uh, the gravitational force is proportional to the product of the masses. <coughs> Inly, inversely proportional to the distance between them. Um, all right, so uh, that's going to be the mathematical relationship right there. Uh, let's uh, make a data table of the force. So when r is zero, but r, r can't be zero, but it can be extremely small. So when it's really small, uh, fg is really big. Force of gravity is really big when they're really close together. And when they're far apart, when they're far apart, R is big. Uh, the force of gravity, of course, is small when they're far apart. All right. And so that's going to look like that. Uh, I should have drawn it here. Small, big. Like that. Uh, that's looking like four. Four. Also, remember while we're here, um, uh, the relationship, the force of gravity, if we're on the surface of the Earth, if we know the uh, gravitational field strength, uh, the force of gravity is the mass times the gravitational field strength. And uh, always keep that in mind. That's the relationship between weight and mass. Don't confuse weight and mass. It's going to come up many times on the test. You will pay dearly by ignoring them and treating weight and mass as the same. You'll lose points on multiple locations. 48 looks like a wave problem. Uh, diagram shows two waves uh, moving towards each other at equal speed in a uniform medium. They must be equal speed. They're in the same medium. If it's uniform, uh, the medium determines the speed, so it must be equal. All right, when they're in that center section, right there, A and B, when the first one gets there, it's looking kind of like, that's better. All right. So the, when that one gets there, if you look at it, there's their equal distance. The other one is also going to be there. And the principle of superposition says when two waves are in the same place at the same time, they add up algebraically. So this thing is going to be double, I don't know if that's double, but bigger, double. That is, uh, we've constructed something more uh, that's constructive interference, which is four. Number four, conveniently fits right in there, number four. Looking like diffraction, the first member of the Cushion family. Here we have a barrier. And we have some waves impinging on the barrier, going like that. Is that a small opening or is that a large opening? Well, I could fit an entire pen cap and pen through there. Does that make it large? Right. You can't choke on this cap, by the way. It's impossible. Don't. Don't even bother trying. 
this is a small opening because it's small compared to a wavelength. So this is a small opening and diffraction is the bending of waves around barriers. Now to this wave, this looks like just barrierness. There's barrierness on this side, barrierness on this side, barrier everywhere because it's a small opening. So what's going to happen is, uh, let's see, it's going to be about right there. We're going to get uh, diffraction, lots of diffraction. The wavelength will stay the same as long as, you know, it looks like we're in the same medium. So it's going to, you know, we're going to get something like that on the other side. Uh, the wavelength's going to stay the same. So it's looking like uh, one, choice one. Wavelength's not going to change. Only time the wavelength would change is if the speed changed. And uh, they don't say the medium's changing, so you can't assume that it is. All right, make sure you know all the different uh, situations with diffraction. That would be a lot of diffraction if uh, <coughs> we drew it like this. So now this is hitting a barrier. This is a large barrier because it's large compared to a wavelength. Wavelength is, you know, so the wave, next wave front's going to hit here. Next wave front's going to be about here. The one, the, the center portion isn't going to uh, be affected because it doesn't hit anything. And then it's going to be, these are going to bend around like that. So we'll get diffraction around the edges like that. And we get something like that. We say that's less diffraction because much of the wave is not diffracting at all because it's so far from the edges. All right. Also know how to draw it around a, uh, you have a glop of something, you know. Know your diffraction pattern. The graph below represents the relationship between energy and equivalent mass from which it can be converted. What is the slope? Oh man, more graphing. All right, wow. Really, you know, uh, energy equivalent mass, we're going to use E equals mc squared. Uh, all right, there it is. Uh, c squared is the slope. C squared is the slope. Uh, speed of light squared is the slope. 9 times 10 to the 16th meter squared per second squared. And that's the end of B1. A 25 meter length of platinum wire of cross-sectional area 3.5 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared has a resistance of 0.757 ohm at 20 degrees C. Calculate the resistivity of the wire. All right, so uh, resistance, of course, is a measurement of how difficult it is to move electrons through or generally charge, but in, for circuits, it's gonna be uh, electrons through a wire or some sort of conductor. Um, resistivity is a property of a material, like a metal, like copper. Um, now they said 20 degrees C, and the reason they said 20 degrees C is because we have a table of resistivities on your electricity uh, reference table page, and it's platinum wire. Wow, platinum. And the resistivity of platinum at 20 degrees C is not there. All right. So can't use that. Can't use the table. 20 degrees C. They, they fooled me. They fooled me by saying 20 degrees C, but platinum is not there. There's only one relationship we're going to be using resistivity. The resistance of the wire, of a hunk of wire like that, is what it's made out of, the resistivity, uh, times the length of the wire. There's the length of the wire, times uh, divided by the cross-sectional area. There's a cross-sectional area. Uh, and they're going to be round, so... We have cross sections of circles. I'll calculate the resistivity of the wire. Um, they gave us the length is uh, 25 meters. They said that the area is 3.50 times 10 to the minus 6 square meters and has a resistance of 0.757 ohms ohms calculate the resistivity of the wire they didn't have to give us the temperature i don't know why they did um <clears throat> all right well let's just rearrange this equation uh resistivity equals r a over l so uh the resistivity oh let's do it over here so the resistivity 
equals um, 0.757 ohms times the area, 3.50 times 10 to the minus 6 meters squared, divided by the L, uh, 25. There we go. 1.06 times 10 to the minus 7 ohm meters. And that seems, that seems reasonable because if I look at my table, they're all like 10 to the minus 8. This is 10 to the minus 7. It's in the ballpark. I'm going to go with that answer. Hopefully it's right. I don't know. Draw at least one full wave of the same amplitude. Same amplitude. So we're going to want it to go uh, one from here to here. And... Um, half the wavelength. All right, so our wavelength here is from here to here. Uh, so our wavelength is 4. So uh, our wavelength, and this one's going to be 2. If we start it and draw it like a cosine wave, we're going to start up here. Um, halfway between, we're going to be down here. So we're going to kind of go like that, go like that. And there we go. Uh, laced one full wave, so I've drawn one full wave if I wanted to keep going. I could if I wanted to be an overachiever. Uh, but anyways, there you go. Same amplitude, half the wavelength. A baseball bat exerts a force of east on a ball. So I'm going to say this way is east. So it's going to exert a force like that. This way. On the ball. Uh... Average force of this is going to be 600 newtons. Imparting an impulse of 3.6 newton seconds east on the ball. All right. We're going to call those numbers positive. Calculate the amount of time the baseball bats in contact with the ball. <coughs> well, <laughs> that's pretty easy. Uh, impulse equals this FT, F delta T. Uh, delta T equals impulse divided by force. 3.6 newton seconds divided by 600 newtons. Make sure you have two significant figures. This has two significant figures. This one had three. Two significant figures. Point z point 0.60 seconds, not... 0.6. That's one significant figure. Make sure that you have two for your answer. What is the impulse of the ball on the bat? Uh, this is the uh, this is the uh, bat on ball. The impulse of the ball on the bat equals 3.6 newton seconds that way okay the ball pushes same impulse the other way do a thought experiment with a compass the needle points north so if i take a compass and put it here the south side is going to be attracted north north to south it will point this way therefore there's a magnetic field that goes like that um, goes like that Goes like that, the magnetic field. All right, that would be what it looks like. Three, at least three magnetic field lines between them. Make sure you can draw magnetic field lines on a bar magnet. Form mm -hmm. closed loops. Like that. Um, of course, it's symmetric. It's actually symmetric in three dimensions. We're only drawing it in two. Make the field lines closer together near the poles. And we'll do our thought experiment again. If I take my uh, compass and put it here, the south side will be attracted that way. So these are coming out of the north side. 
that's the direction. Make sure you can draw the magnetic field lines around uh, various, uh, a bar magnet and different configurations like that, which are in your notes. Determine the magnitude of the acceleration of the car. Well, the definition of acceleration is delta V over delta T. So let's just find some data points. Um, I'll find uh, two data points. I'll say uh, zero meters per oops, zero seconds and zero meters per second will be one. And the next one I will use will be eight seconds and 10 meters per second. All right, uh, so what do we have? Um, uh, delta V is going to be uh, 10 meters per second minus zero meters per second. Uh, delta T is going to be eight seconds minus zero seconds. Uh, is going to be the acceleration for number 57. Calculate the total distance the car traveled um, from four to eight seconds. You can either find the area under the curve or you can just say the uh, distance traveled is the average velocity uh, times time. Um, the average velocity uh, between four seconds and eight seconds is, average velocity is, V initial plus V final divided by two. It's the numeric average. Um, let's see, at four seconds, it looks like it's five meters per second. And at eight seconds, it looks like it's 10 meters per second divided by two. So that's 15 divided by two, which is 7.5 meters per second. So the average velocity is 7.5 meters per second, and it does that for four seconds. It's four seconds, uh, the time interval between uh, eight and, uh, so it's gonna be 30 meters. Uh, the time interval between four seconds and eight seconds is four. All right, so uh, that is uh, the answer, 30 meters. Parallel circuit, know your circuits. That's a parallel circuit. And, uh, you know, know the idea where if you have two, two resistors and or when, whenever you add a resistor in parallel, the equivalent resistance goes down. We have an ammeter. We have R1 and R2. <coughs> 30 volts. Determine the equivalent resistance of a circuit. All right, well, we know uh, this one's 20 ohms. But we don't know that one, so we can't use our equation. Um, we have, we do have an equation for a parallel, um, but we don't know uh, R2, so we can't use that. Um, but, uh, you know, the whole idea is that we, we could have, we're going to replace this with an equivalent circuit that looks like this. Our equivalent, that doesn't look like equivalent, but it is, trust me, 3.0 volts, or 30 volts. And we had uh, two amps, is it? Yes, it is, two amps. Two amperes flowing around here. So therefore, uh, we could just uh, solve our equivalent in this circuit. So R equals V over I equals 30 volts divided by two amps, all right? Since it's a simple circuit, um, the voltage across our equivalent is 30 volts and it's a series circuit, so the current is the same everywhere. So that looks like it's gonna be 15 ohms. All right. Uh, 15 ohms, well, I can feel good about that. That's less than 20, it has to be. Couldn't be more. If you got more, you had a problem. Calculate R2. All right, well, I have R equivalent, I have R1, I can calculate R2. One over R equivalent minus one over R1, just bring R1 over the other side, equals one over R2. I want R2, so let's invert both sides. Uh, all right, so plugging these numbers in, we have one over 15 ohms minus one over 20 ohms. And 
If this was 20, our equivalent would be 10. So it's got to be, it must be more than 20 ohms. Let's see what it is. 60 ohms, yes. 60 ohms is R2. 60 ohms, I can feel good about that answer. A 28 gram rubber stopper is attached to a string and whirled clockwise in a horizontal circle with a radius of 0 0.80 meters. The diagram in your booklet represents the motion. There it is, right there. Now the, stopper, the stopper maintains a constant speed of 2.5 meters per second. Okay, constant speed, of course the velocity is always changing. Calculate the magnitude of the centripetal acceleration of the stopper. All right, uh, well, centripetal acceleration, um, AC equals V squared over R equals 2.5 meters per second squared over the radius, uh, which is 0 0.80 meters. 7.81 meters per second squared. Let's see how many significant figures I should have. Let's see, two, well, actually two, two, all right, looks like two. So 7.8 meters per second squared is the centripetal acceleration. Calculate the magnitude on the diagram. Draw an arrow represent the direction of the centripetal force. Well, it's going around a circle like that. Uh, the centripetal force is in the direction of the net force. Uh, something in uniform circular motion. Um, has a, there's only, actually there's a net force towards the center. So this is the direction of the net force, which is also called the centripetal force, which in this case would be the tension, force of tension. And of course, at this point, you also need to know that the velocity is this way, although they're not going to, that's not what they asked you here. Velocity is that way, and the speed is constant, and the acceleration is also in this direction. It's also towards the center because the net force is towards the center. Know all those things for uniform circular motion. We're on part C now. This is one of those reading uh, problems. <clears throat> they do this a lot now. I wanna make sure you can read. It says auroras over polar regions of the earth are caused by collisions between charged particles from the sun and atoms in the earth's atmosphere. The charged particles give energy to the atoms, exciting them from the lowest available energy level, the ground state, to higher energy levels, excited states. Most atoms return to the ground state within 10 nanoseconds. 10 nanoseconds. All right, so that's 10, and let's look up nano. I believe that's 10 to the minus nine seconds. Look that up, 10 nanoseconds. Look up those prefixes up there. You have plenty of time, don't start to, don't start the bleachers. Yeah, I'm done. Yeah, I'm done. I'm so, I'm so fast. Please give me a gold star for being done first. I am so, you must be so proud of me. And my parents must also be so proud because I'm done first. And I'm staring at the bleachers. Uh, so look it up. Make sure you don't make that mistake. 10 nanoseconds. There we go. Now, if we look at question six, 66, it says, what is the order of magnitude of the time in seconds that most atoms spend in the excited state? This is a garbage question. We don't know the answer to this, but the state wouldn't give on this one because they didn't say most atoms. They said, most atom, or what is the order of magnitude in time that most atoms spend in the excited state? They said most atoms return to their state within 10 nanoseconds. They didn't say that at 10 nanoseconds. So most of them could have uh, dropped down in a tenth of a nanosecond. So it's really a garbage question, but we have to deal with it anyway. So here it is. Um, what is the order of magnitude of time in seconds that most atoms spend in the excited state? Well, what is 10 times 10 to the uh, minus nine? Well, we want this to be a one. We basically wanna know what power of 10, but this is multiplied by 10. So let's make this 1.0 times 10 to the, so I've made this one smaller. I have to make this one bigger, right? So these are the same number, 
Uh, look, this is the second time we've had to do something like this. Make sure you can do that. Um, so this one is, uh, what order of magnitude is it? Uh, minus 8. That's what they're looking for. Uh, what is the order of magnitude, time, and seconds that most atoms spend in an excited state? Minus 8 is the order of magnitude. Not 10 to the minus 8, although they did give on that and they actually gave credit. They initially weren't going to give it. I would think this year it just needs to be minus 8 is the order of magnitude. So order of magnitude is just the power of 10. All right. Make sure you know that. Calculate the energy of a photon in joules that accounts for the red glow of the aurora. Uh, and later it says, in higher regions of Earth's atmosphere, where there are fewer collisions, uh, a few of the atoms remain in the excited state for longer times. For example, oxygen atoms remain in an excited state for up to one second. These atoms account for the greenish uh, and red glows of the auroras. As the oxygen atoms return to the ground state, they emit green photons of frequency 5.38 times 10 to the 14 hertz and red photons 4.76 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Uh, these emissions last long enough to produce the changing aurora for, uh, phenomenon. Calculate the energy of the photon joules for the red glow. All right, so we have the frequency of the red glow. The frequency is 4.76 times 10 to the 14 hertz. And uh, we want to know the energy in joules. Energy of a photon equals Planck's constant times the frequency. Uh, Planck's constant is, let's look that up. I don't remember it, 6.63 times 10 to the minus 34 joule seconds times the frequency, which is 4.76 times 10 to the 14 hertz. All right. We will get joules because this is joule seconds. Hertz is per second. All right. Equation, substitution units, answers to units. Explain what is meant by an atom in the, in the ground state. The ground state is the lowest, uh, it's when the electron, the valence electrons is, are in the lowest uh, possible energy state, so in the lowest energy orbitals. That's the ground state. A girl rides her bicycle 1.4 kilometers west, 0.7 south, 0.3 east, 12 minutes. The vector diagram in your answer booklet represents so we have the 1.4 kilometers, 0.7. We're going to have to add the 0.3 kilometers east. Um, use a scale of one centimeter equals 0.2 kilometers. So one centimeter on the page equals 0.2 kilometers in the girl's world. It's a girl's world. Um, draw a vector represent a 0.3 kilometer east displacement. Label the vector with its magnitude. All right. She's going to go east, which is this way. So a grand step uh, protractor here. Uh, 0.3 kilometers uh, multiplying by ones equals 1.5 centimeters. All right. All right, let's draw 1.5 centimeters. It's a line. That's not a vector. Got to put a direction on it. And its magnitude is, of course, 0 0.30 kilometers. It doesn't look like a point. There we go. Make sure you're accurate within half a centimeter. Otherwise, they're going to ding you for points. Um, draw the vector representing the resultant displacement uh, for the girl in the entire trip. She started here and ended there. That's it. She started here, ended there. That's the way she went. And label the vector R. R, there's our vector R. Calculate the girl's average speed uh, for the entire trip. Her average speed is distance divided by time. Is uh, Her distance that she traveled was 1.4 kilometers plus point, oops, 0.70 kilometers plus 0.30 kilometers kilometers and divided by 12 minutes. 
0.20 kilometers per minute. 0 0.20 kilometers per minute. Determine the magnitude of the girl's displacement for the entire trip. All right, well, uh, I think that I'm going to uh, take a ruler and uh, measure. I'm going to use this, I'm going to do this graphically. So I'm going to take the ruler and uh, that looks like it's uh, right exactly six centimeters actually. So, uh, so she traveled six centimeters on the page, but we need to convert that to kilometers. And we want centimeters to go away. So we're going to take uh, 1.0 centimeters. Oh, break the lid. 0 0.20 kilometers. And uh, what do we have? 1.2 kilometers. Does that make sense? Sure, that makes sense. That's 1.4. 1 1.2 seems reasonable. 1.2 kilometers. Determine the measure of the angle in degrees. Okay, the measure of the angle. So let's measure 32 degrees. 32 degrees. A light ray of frequency 5.09 times 10 to the 14 hertz. Beautiful. We can use our reference table. Um, so let's get that let's get that reference table handy. Gave us the frequency so we can use that's a flavor of yellow light. We can use uh, the yellow uh, to do traveling in water. All right, and goes from water to air. At the interface, part of the ray is reflected and part of it is refracted. What is the angle of reflection at the interface? Well, that's the weirdest thing I've ever seen. So I guess we have to draw the normal. You get it? You get the joke? Aim, aim for. All right, so I've drawn my normal. Always draw normal. Some of you refuse to draw normal. Don't know why. You just do. You just aren't going to be drawing normals. Oh, well, I tried. What is the angle of reflection of the light ray at the interface? Um, 35 degrees. All right. Uh, 35 degrees. On diagram, use a protractor and draw the reflected ray. All right. So 35 degrees. 35, right there. There we go. Reflect it off. 35 degrees. Let's make sure it's 35. It looks like it's 35 to me. All right. Calculate the angle of refraction as it enters air. All right. Angle of refraction. Uh, I'll call this medium 1 and this medium 2. Uh, N1, looking up in the reference table, is uh, 1.33. Uh, N2 is 1.00. Um, angle of incidence equals 35 degrees. We want to know what the angle of refraction is. You, let's use Snell's law. N1 sine of theta 1 equals N2 sine of theta 2. Let's see what theta 2, we'll put a 2 there. Theta 2 equals N1 sine of theta 1 all over N2, and that's the inverse sine of all this stuff. That's yeah, terrible. I didn't write that very well at all. Anyways, sine of negative 1 of N1, 1 1.33. Sine of theta 1, 35 degrees. Divided by 1. Let's see what that comes out to be. Forty nine point seven degrees. Forty nine point seven degrees. Let's see. Does that make sense? Uh, it's going to speed up. So it needs to be passed. All right. Yeah. Forty nine point seven. We probably have to draw that. Let's see what it says. Uh, calculate the angle of refraction as it enters the air. 
identify at least one characteristic of the light ray that is the same in both the water and the air. Same characteristic, the frequency. The frequency is the same in the water and the air. That's the only thing that is the same, I think. Um, uh, the wavelength is going to change, the speed's going to change. I'm actually going to draw that 49 points. Something like that. Something like that. Bends away from the normal because it speeds up. Determine the total work done by the 30.4 Newton force. Uh, all right. Work equals force times displacement, where the force and the displacement have to be in the same direction. The force is this way. The displacement is that way. They're in the same direction. So the force is 30.4 Newtons. The displacement is 6 meters. All right. That's the work that this force did. Uh, we're going to want three significant figures because that's what everything has. Calculate the total increase in gravitational potential energy. So you did work that increases the energy of the system. Um, a part of the increase in the energy is going to be gravitational potential energy. Uh, part of it could be internal energy if, it's, uh, if there's friction. And uh, part of it is kinetic energy if it's still moving. When we get there, state what happens to the kinetic energy as it goes along. Let's see. Kinetic energy, of course, is one half mv squared. Well, the mass stays the same. What happens to the speed? If the speed increases, the kinetic energy is going up. If the speed remains the same, kinetic energy is the same. If the speed lowers, it's getting less. Let's see. A force is used to slide a four newton distance in meters at constant speed. It's constant speed, so kinetic energy remains the same. 84. Kinetic energy remains the same. They said the speed remains the same, therefore the kinetic energy remains the same. State what happens to the internal energy. Well, um, as it slides along the incline. I skipped a problem. Calculate the total increase in gravitational potential energy. All right, so we'll say potential energy here is zero. What's the potential energy here? Uh, potential energy is MGH uh, four, so MG uh, delta H, it's a change in potential energy. Uh, MG is 40 Newtons. Recognize that. That's the weight. MG is the weight. Uh, don't treat it like a mass and multiply it by G. It doesn't make any sense. It shows you don't know what you're talking about. H, three meters. Equals 120 joules. All right. So we got it up here. 120 joules of potential energy. We did 182 uh, newtons. Er, wow, newtons. That's joules. That's, that's joules, not newtons. It's joules. Um, 182 joules of uh, work to get it up there. So uh, some of that, 62 joules, must have been internal energy. And that says 85. So, so this was uh, 82, I guess. 82, uh, the potential energy is 120 joules. Um, what happens to the internal energy of the crate as it slides along? Uh, internal energy increases. 85. Uh, Q increases. Remember, internal energy is Q. Q increases as you go up, and in indeed, uh, when it gets to the top, 62 joules of uh, internal energy has heated up. Anyways, the, uh, the ramp heats up and so does the crate. Uh, it doesn't really heat up, it increases its thermal energy. All right, that's the end of the exam. I hope you did well, I hope you kept track, hope you tried it. Maybe check the answers and uh, keep track, see how many you're getting right. Uh, later. It's